Um, all right, good afternoon. Um, my name is Katie Sill, and I'm the director of the Water Point Data Exchange Program, or what we call WPDX, um, with Global Water Challenge. And today, my colleague Adam Kareev and I will present on challenges and opportunities in harmonizing data to help support evidence based decisions for the rural water sector. Uh, the challenge is that the world is not on track to reach the sustainable development goal target of providing universal access to water and sanitation by 2030, and rural access continues to lag urban. You can see here in the map uh, that countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and Oceania, so excluding Australia and New Zealand, currently have the highest access gaps. A uh, contributor to the lack of, of progress is that most countries don't have adequate finance to reach their, um, their WASH targets. So we either need to find a lot more money or make our money go further by improving our efficiencies of the investments that we can make. Uh, one way to do this is to harness data to prioritize uh, investments to help reach the most unserved people possible. However, in general, we don't have the type of data at the subnational level that we need to complete these analyses. Uh, to give a quick sense of what we mean here when we're talking about rural water and rural water access, um, here are some photographs from around the world um, of the types of water points that we're seeking to collect data about. So these are not household systems, but instead public water points where individuals are typically traveling to collect water and then transport it back home. Um, management of these varies. Sometimes it's the community or it's the local government, a private company. Um, and these are different kinds of, you know, hand pumps, springs, rain, rainwater catchment, and so on. Um, let's see. Uh, there are a lot of groups that are working in this space and a growing recognition that um, evidence-based decisions will improve the impact of our rural water programs. So more and more organizations are collecting monitoring and other routine data than ever before. Um, they're working towards using that data to inform decisions However, if the data is not shared, then each entity only has their piece of the much larger puzzle. So WPDX is a platform which is bringing these puzzle pieces together um, through a data standard and an ingestion engine that we'll go into more detail um, about later. Um, WPDX harmonizes data regardless of the organization or collection platform used into a singular data set. Uh, this data set is available online in our data repository and playground. Um, with all of these different contributions, we get a much better sense of the landscape. And once these pieces are together, WPDX can provide analytical tools to give key insights and try and make sense of the picture. I think of it as like making those um, magic eye puzzles from the 90s. You know, once you put the pieces together, you still need specialized knowledge to find that 3D image to, to pop out. Uh, to sort of jump to the end and demonstrate why we want to bring this data together, I want to show you a quick summary of our decision support tools. Um, we have four tools in development um, to support four key questions that have been identified by government decision makers. Uh, the first is how many people lack access per district, so at that sub-national level. Uh, second is which uh, water point rehabilitation would reach the most people. Then where is the most efficient place to build a new water point or new construction? And then finally, which water points are at the highest risk of failure and why? So the first of these tools, the first uh, three of these tools use spatial analytics to determine the populations who are currently unserved um, based on the functionality of the water points that we have within our data set. And with this approach, we can estimate water access by district or actually sub-district as shown here for Sierra Leone. All of the tools um, have a map output along with the CSV download if you want to do um, further analysis. Um, we can also use this approach to identify which water point rehabilitation, so which water points are broken and which ones should we fix first, um, will have the highest number of people who can be reached. Um, this also includes a CSV output and an optional satellite view uh, to get a better idea of what the community looks like. Um, the larger the circle, the more people who could be served with this fix. Uh, similarly, our new construction prioritization tool shows locations where newly constructed water points would have the potential to reach the greatest number of people who are not currently served by an existing water point. Um, this tool doesn't yet, we're, we're hoping to one day include hydrogeological information, but it does demonstrate where there's population centers who are in need of, uh, of a water point. 
And finally, our predict uh, water point status tool, which was developed in partnership with Data Robot, uh, uses attributes from our standard and some external data, such as precipitation or land use information, paired with a machine learning model uh, to determine which water points may be at higher risk for failure within relevant timeframes. So we can either actually get an idea of, you know, is it working as of um, as of today in one year and three years based on the understanding of the system. Uh, the goal of this is that any one of these tools can provide valuable information, but taken together, they can provide support through the entire process. So starting here on the left, you know, once the once the national water budget has been determined, um, we can use this uh, district tool to identify which districts may need the most resources to catch up based on their level of coverage. And then at the district level, district managers can use the tools to identify priority locations for rehabilitation, new constructive, new construction, and even preventative maintenance. And in a recent desktop review of 12 districts in Sierra Leone, we found that on average, sorry, on average, um, using WPDX support tools would have helped reach about three times more people nationally um, and reduce costs by about a third. And that's because a lot of times water points are put in or fixed in areas that are already served by existing points. So our analysis is really designed to help focus on the unserved population. So feedback from government partners makes us confident that bringing this data together will allow for meaningful analysis to help make better decisions and ultimately improve services. So we want to take a step back now and dive a bit deeper into some of the challenges that we faced and talk through some of our approaches. Um, first off, water point data does not come from a single source. We have contributions from governments, NGOs, academic researchers, and many more. And there is no agreement on a standard collection schema. People have a lot of different reasons they collect data and a lot of different parameters that are defined slightly differently. Um, for all of us who work in you know, field data or with field data, the reality is that it's incomplete, it's noisy, it's duplicative, duplicative and fuzzy. So at the start, we have a lot of puzzle pieces that may or may not actually fit together. So the first step was back in 2014, we collaborated with an international working group to define a data standard. Um, and that was using parameters that were both widely collected and were of interest at scale. Um, this was a very iterative process that resulted eventually in six required parameters and 20 optional, optional parameters that are listed here. Um, the standard is live, it, evolved, it evolves with the sector, um, but essentially we're looking at parameters that describe the location, the type, the functionality of the water point. All right, and now over to Adam. <clears throat> okay. Um, so Katie mentioned the, the standard, but uh, um, even with the standard and assuming everyone would sort of uh, uh, use the standard, we're still uh, in big problems because the data that is provided inside the standard is uh, is inc inconsistent and and uh, it's not just about the fields, but but it's also about the about the the values themselves. So here you have a, an example of of uh, um, basically the same technology being reported in different rows. Uh, it can be can be provided in, in in lots of different ways, and the same kind of of water point can be described in lots of, lots, of, lots of different ways. So it's not not just about the 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 fields, but also about the data uh, inside the fields. Um, so uh, again, we need to, to understand the domain to, to develop some heuristic to do that to do that sort of mapping. So I, I want to talk a bit about uh, um, sort of the, the, the technological solution that we um, implemented to uh, sort of tackle those challenges. You know, the, the multiple organizations and the fuzzy uh, data and the fuzzy structure. And one of the goals uh, uh, in that solution, uh, we, we can go to the next slide. Um, one, one of the goals there was to um, create something that, that would be friendly enough so that those uh, people uh, in those organizations would be able to uh, upload their data uh, to, this, to, to this system without having to be uh, extremely technical or and, and having to have some, you know, data wrangling capabilities. Um, we 
don't uh, uh, want to sort of uh, require a specific structure or specific values because if we do put these requirements, it just means that we won't get the data because sometimes the files are just there and either we do the wrangling or no one else will will do that. So we wanted to be able to, to, to get the data as is. Um, again, we didn't want to enforce any specific format. We wanted to be as, as, uh, um, as accepting as possible. Um, and giving some agency to the people uh, uploading the data to see if there are any, uh, if there are any errors or validation errors and, and be able to fix them themselves. So it, it really needed to be something that would be sort of uh, uh, tackle all the barriers that we usually uh, uh, encounter in these sort of systems. Um, and the, the way that um, we tackle that is, is basically using a platform called uh, DGP. Um, I think that's in the next slide. Which, which basically is, is a platform um, that, that uh, is, is sort of a, an evolution of, uh, of work that I've been doing for quite some time. It started with a, uh, open spending. I don't know if you, uh, if you know that, but it's basically a similar system that was focused on fiscal data. And, and from there, uh, I sort of uh, took the, these concepts and tried to build something that would be more uh, generic, uh, built on, on top of the frictionless data uh, framework. Uh, and, and the data flows uh, Python library. Uh, and the idea is that this platform basically uh, gets uh, um, a schema. Uh, in our case, this schema is uh, um, more or less a, a transformation of the standard. Uh, Katie, if you can go to the previous slide. So, so the, the data standard is, is basically transformed to a, a schema or a taxonomy that just says the same things, but in a, in a more, uh, sort of a technical way. So each one of those fields has a definition, has a data type, is, it's defined if it's mandatory or, 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 or optional. Um, it has some validation rules. Um, and once that schema is uh, sort of put in, in the DGP uh, platform, then uh, people can uh, um, basically go to the platform, upload a file and, and do a, a simple process of mapping the columns in their uh, a source file to the columns of that schema, um, where mandatory columns are uh, sort of mandatory and optional columns are the more the merrier, but uh, uh, are not uh, uh, not obviously required. Um, and they can see interactively um, the, 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 the different uh, errors or validation errors in case they, they have them. But again, if some rows are failing, it doesn't mean that the entire file uh, fails. Uh, it just gives them some error. Uh, they can uh, provide all kinds of, of uh, uh, parameters. Katie, can you go to the next slide? Um, yeah, so they can provide all kinds of parameters, for example, um, undefined values. So if there's some, you know, some value that actually means that this cell is empty, they can specify that. Or if, for example, they have uh, uh, unique date formats or number formats or different true-false values, uh, which are not uh, uh, exactly true-false. In our case, it would be, I don't know, functional and uh, uh, non-functional sometimes for water points. Um, and on top of that, we apply all kinds of uh, custom cleaning and transformations. For example, converting the uh, water tech, water source that we saw earlier that can uh, come in, in lots of different flavors, we map them into uh, standard values. Um, oh, we're at morning. All right. Um, so let's see how it, how it actually works. So we have a very nice uh, video. Um, so basically, you just log into the system using uh, your Google account. Uh, you upload your source data uh, to the system um after uh which is which can be again it could be a csv file and excel file you can also provide a link to an api or a google spreadsheet if you want you need to provide some metadata the metadata is again configurable um uh, this sort of metadata on on the sort of on the entire uh source and then once you provide uh, uh that file the system automatically detects 
the file format if you have some you know some header rows and it would and then it gives you a, a, an opportunity to map all the uh, to map columns from the file to the schema um, the idea here is that um, it looks like a very long process but once you've mapped a similar file the system will try to automate it for you so uh, if you have a column that was some time in the past already mapped to a specific uh, a column in the in the in the standard it will automatically suggest that um, and at the end of this process you basically submit this mapping for approval um, what happens then is that katie gets an email saying okay there's a new uh, uh, source uploaded um, she can then take a look see if she approves the uh, the file and, and and if so it would go and uh, um, basically join the rest of the water points in the in the harmonized data set okay do you want to take it from here sure thanks adam um, this is just an example of kind of us bringing in the data so you can see here on the left is a list of different ngos and organizations that have shared data with us and here's as they kind of appear on the map and you can begin to just see you know each of these pieces coming together to present a much better um, overall view What's neat is at the end, the Ministry of Water, so the government data set comes in, um, but you can actually see that some of these NGOs are still working in spaces where the government didn't have that data. So it can even provide information to the government as well as to others working in the sector. Just to give a quick kind of here's where we're at and the road ahead, um, we have over 600,000 water point records currently uploaded from over 80 organizations. And we are working to sort of continue to build new and improve upon our existing tools. Um, to allow for better visualizations, you know, an easier identification of, of these locations where you might want to work, um, figuring out which locations are likely to fail, and really digging into that why um, and what can be done to, to help avoid that. And this is about, you know, as data-driven data, data decisions are, um, providing an objective perspective to balance with political pressures. Water is a very political area, and so this is trying to kind of balance out and focus on, on where there's unserved people. Um, just a, a nod and appreciation to our very generous uh, funders and key partners, um, our contact details here, and that's it. Thank you so much. I think we have time for a question um, from, from the audience. I'd like to hear uh, how you build relationships with local groups and partners. Uh, excuse me, to get work done and to the end result of new water points. How do you build trust to encourage people to share data and work with you? Any stories to share? Uh, probably more stories than we have time for, but yes, I mean, great question. And it's a big part of the challenge and opportunity, I think, in that open data space. Um, sharing water data can, for some organizations, come very easily, and others it does take a longer term relationship of trying to demonstrate Kind of the end result. Here's what you can do with this data if you share it with us. Um, and working with a lot of local groups. So we are based um, in the US, but we work very closely with NGOs and local partners um, who can build those longer term, you know, trusting relationships with the governments to ensure that they feel comfortable. Um, making your data transparent can be a big step. Um, so we've done sort of longer term relationships with Sierra Leone, which I mentioned. Uh, we're working also in um, Ethiopia and Ghana and Uganda at various stages of kind of developing those relationships and making sure that the data is well you know, protected and, and safe and also that the results are, are um, responsive to government need or responsive to organizational need. Um, and that has so far brought us a, a fair a number of organizations that are willing to share. 